This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. I think I finally made it into a rut where I found out these lessons take me about two weeks to do a lesson. So that's okay. Uh, at least I know the rut I'm in. Does anybody need a handout? Whether you weren't here last week or you lost it or the dog ate it or at least that's the kids excuses, right? All right. Now who's the main character? Well, I shouldn't really say that. Uh, who is this main character we met last week in the story? Genesis chapter 14. Lot. No, not, not a lot. What's that? Melchizedek, yes. Um, and let me get to there. I'm going to turn to Genesis 14 again. Genesis chapter 14. Now let's skip down here. I don't think we need to... Well, let's, let's review the chapter. Okay, so what has happened in this chapter? What's the storyline of this chapter? Remember, the chapter 13, Lot um, has, has separated from Abram. They, he has moved into Sodom. Chapter 13, he's kind of... They're now in Sodom. Abram is reaffirmed of the promises of God. God tells him again. He promises him. And in chapter 14, what happens? Well, he's in Abraham's in Sodom. Sodom. Okay, yeah. Um, the armies from in, an international coalition comes together. You have some Mesopotamian kings. You have uh, quite possibly some Hittite kings, which would be from Turkey, coming together uh, because these cities in Canaan refuse to pay their tribute. And so after 13 years of tribute, they say, no, we're not paying. And in the 14th year, or after 12 years of tribute, they say no, then, or whatever. How, however that works, the, the text will tell you on that one. Uh, in the 13th year, they rebelled. There we go, verse 4. And in the 14th year came Shedol Lamer. And so this coalition of kings come in, and they are, they're just on the move. They're just taking out city after city after city. They're taking the spoil, and they're going back home. Oh, I'm kind of a... A bullying approach to hey don't forget who you we have to put you in your place every once in a while here so so that's what they do and what city is taken with these cities Sodom, Sodom. yes the Sodom um, what's Sodom that and Gomorrah yes Sodom and Gomorrah they're both taken they're taken captive and lots nephews involved in this group so he is him and his family, so Lot and his family are taken captive, and Abram makes this bold approach. Now, now why was it such, by way of review, why is this such a different view of Abram in this chapter? What makes chapter 14 so unique in how we look at Abram? Well, Abram is not used to solve Okay, no, he's, he's, he's not connected with Sodom and Gomorrah, that's true. Up until this point, has Abram been pictured as a mighty warrior? No. 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 So we're seeing another side of him that so far has not been seen or introduced. Um, what made this so significant in that, I mean, how big were these armies? How strong were they? <laughs> what had they already done? <laughs> well, they captured all five, the five kings down there in the valley where there was money, so they probably had some strength. Okay, they've already captured multiple cities, and what did we note about some of the cities they captured? 
I think it's on page three. There's a big arrow pointing to it. They were giants. These were some of these cities were actually clans of giants. Um, so they were. This army was on the move, and they were quite successful. And here Abram steps out in faith, and he says, "I'm going to go back, get Lot back." Now, after victory, and after he gets Lot back, and the spoil and the goods, what does he? On his way home, who does he meet? Melchizedek, okay, who is the king of Salem, which we think and would probably pretty good educated guess is what city? Jerusalem, okay. And what does Abram do to Melchizedek or for Melchizedek? He bless, they, bless, they bless him. Okay, he, Abram gives Melchizedek a tithe of what they received. And he blesses him. And then in return, Melchizedek blesses him. And uh, Abram then goes along his way. And we're going to get into looking at that. We have on page 5 is where we left off with those cycles of blessing. God had blessed Abram as he responded in faith. As part of Abram's response and, and joy over victory, he blesses Melchizedek and, with a tithe. And Melchizedek then blesses Abram with a blessing. Um, and that's the same as true in our lives. God blesses us. So we can bless others, and as we bless others, others in return tend to bless us. Although, to be quite honest, it's not as clear usually as this circle makes it. <laughs> Sometimes you bless person A, who blesses person B, who blesses person C, and then person F, way down the line, somehow blesses you, all right? So that's, sometimes it's a really a spread out trickle effect, um, but God desires um, for us to be a blessing to others. Page six is where we will start today's lesson. See here uh, on page six. It says Abram tithe has a very deep significance. Okay, first of all, Abram recognized Melchizedek's priesthood. Now, what were the two priesthoods that we have recorded in Scripture? Now, let me clarify. There are a lot of priesthoods recorded in Scripture. There's priest of Baal. There's priest of Asheroth. But we're dealing with priesthoods that deal with God in heaven. What are the two, I guess you could argue for a third, priesthoods in Scripture? I, I can argue for three. Okay. Levitical priesthood, which was established when? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, well, yes, it was established in Leviticus, but uh, kind of in Exodus, actually. But um, on Mount Sinai, God established the Levitical priesthood. Now, to be in the Levitical priesthood, what did you have to be? A descendant of Aaron and descendant of Levi, right? Levi. Anybody here qualify? No. Okay, no, I don't either. Um, so Melchizedek here is a priest. What was his priesthood after? We're going to look at that one, so maybe I don't want to answer my question now. What's the third priesthood that is mentioned in Scripture? Anybody think of any? We've got a priesthood of the believers. Priesthood of the believers, all right. What's that? Are we Levites? No. Okay. Are we authorized to go do sacrifices? No. <laughs> so what is the priesthood of the believer? You're just getting all the answers. The privilege that we have to go to God. We can go directly to God. We have God's word. And Peter says that the prophecy of Scripture is not of any private interpretation. Okay? Nobody has, well, this is the interpretation, and it's, you know, you can't think for yourself. It has to be this way. No, when we read the Scripture, the Holy Spirit opens it to us, and there's not a private interpretation. It's, it's general and broad enough to meet every need, and when we read the Bible, we don't have to go through some priest or somebody else in order to, 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 do it, to, to understand the Bible. Now, does that mean we don't preach and we don't teach and we don't do Bible studies? We still do Bible studies. Yeah, we still do. 
Am I forcing you to believe something? No. No, what I what my endeavor is to lay out what I see as truth from scripture. You may disagree with me on points. That's okay. Give me 50 years and I'll probably disagree with myself. Um, so the more we study scripture and the more as a group we come together, uh, we, we get a clearer picture of what it's saying. But Elizabeth, there's no private interpretation. We can go directly to God. We can directly pray to God. We don't have to go to a priest and confess our sins. We don't have to do any of that because a way has been made for us to go directly to God. Did you have something? That's what I was going to add. It's more than just interpretation and stuff like that. It's just and, uh, dealing with sin. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go through somebody else. It's directly to God. Right. And uh, when we deal with sin, we may have to confess it to another person who we've wronged, but we're not confessing to a third party who knows nothing. We confess to God, and we get right with the person we've offended. Um, and if it's a whole group of people, then the whole group. But uh, we don't have to go to confessional uh, and pay our little tithes or whatever. Um, I'm, not, I'm not very well acclimated with Catholic tradition, so I probably said something all wrong there. Anyway, so he recognized his priesthood. Abram's action legitimized the later tithing to the Levitical priesthood. How were the Levites provided for in Israel? Somebody remember? There was a certain amount of the sacrifices, there was a tithe of that, that went to the Levitical priests, the, the Levites. Another question, did the Levites own any land in Israel? Every tribe gets land but the Levites, with the exception of they get something a little smaller than great sections of land. What do they get? I think it was ten cities. There were cities, um, and they were connected with the cities of refuge, but there was even Levitical cities where these Levites were, were there in those cities. And it's interesting to note, when you map all those cities on Israel, Nobody in Israel was more than 10 miles from a Levite. Now, why is that significant? They could reach it, and that'd be like going from here to Fort Laramie. They could reach that in a day's walk, and why would they care about going to see a Levite? What did the Levites care for and care after? Not just that, but they were exposed to the Word of God, weren't they? Yeah, the priesthood. They were the ones that copied Scripture. They were the ones that taught Scripture. They were the ones that, if you wanted to get to know God and His Word, this guy is a guy you'd go to. Not that God wouldn't, you know, He only worked through the Levites, but these were the men of God in a certain sense. Now, were they always men of God and acted that way? No, and we have some very graphic stories in the Old Testament how they, they were very uh, corrupt at times. But the reality is they didn't get all the physical inheritance that the rest of Israel got, but they got a spiritual inheritance. And um, this action of Abram where he ties to Melchizedek set a precedent for Israel saying, hey, look, you need to take care of these guys. Yes, they're not farming land. Yes, they're not doing this, that, and the other. But they are taking care of the things of God. They're taking care of the temple. They, are, they have their own unique job that God has called them to do. And the rest of Israel is responsible to help support them. Um, comments or questions before we go to the third point here? Three, Abram's action sets an example for us to follow. Uh, you may remember back when we went through that series, um, I don't remember what it was called, but I remember the book it was out of. Um, it was like 10 different concepts of Christian living. And that book took a position that tithing is not something New Testament. Now, was Abram living in New Testament ties, times? 
And did he tithe? No. Yes. He tithe. Now you could argue, I suppose, well, this is only one instance we have. Hardly say hardly say Well, do we really think that working with, let's say, making money? Okay, now, we know that when he went to Egypt, he increased. His flocks and his herds and everything increased, and he... But you know, just because it's absent doesn't mean that he wasn't doing sacrifices along the way. We just don't have record of it. Um, does that make a little sense? Um, going once, going twice. <laughs> so anyway, his actions, Abram's actions, set an example for us to follow. D. Now you want to pay for it, sorry. Bring me in. Um, Abram distanced himself from the king of Sodom. I'll read the, the quote here that I found helpful from Alan Ross. Um, he said, This incident was a test of Abram's faith after a great deal of victory. Bera, Sodom's king, offered a most appealing deal. But Abram, knowing what he did about the king of Sodom, felt that keep, keeping Sodom's loot, which he captured, would make him subject to Bera. He wanted something far more enduring than possessions and wealth. He wanted the fulfillment of God's miraculous and enduring promise. Faith looks beyond the riches of this world to the grander prospect God has in store. There is a little bit of a chiasm here in the text, which is where you introduce a character, then you move on, then you come back. You have first here the king of Sodom meets Abram in, cha in chapter 14, verse 17. Then you have the king of Salem meeting Abram in verse 18. The king of Salem then blesses Abram in 19 to 20. And then it ends out back to the king of Sodom. He bargains with Abram. Let's go take a look at that. Now that you kind of got um, the framework or structure there. Verse 17. And the king of Sodom met, went out to meet him after his uh, return from the slaughter of Keterlamer. And the kings were with him in the valley of Shava, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a, a shoe latchet. And I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Okay? Abram here distances himself from Sodom. Did Abram have rights to this stuff? You bet he did. And I think he exercised his rights in that he gave a tithe of it. When he pursued after Lot and those who had been captured, all the stuff that had been captured, who did it did it belong did any of that belong to Abram? No. Okay. Initially, though, it was not his stuff that was stolen, right? But he's the conqueror. He's the savior. <laughs> he's the one who stepped in, and, and he's the one who, who saved these people from these other kings. Don't you think he's due right to <laughs> you know, take what he wants? And so he, in a sense, he takes, what he, he takes a 10% and gives it to the king of Sodom. And he takes what, in the last verse of the chapter 24, he said, Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion which, uh, of the men that went with me. 
Aidner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. Basically, he took enough to cover his expenses. Okay, these other guys that went with him, you know, this could have been a this is probably a several day escapade. What they ate along the way, what they needed along the way, the, he covered his expenses, and everything else went back to the king of Sodom or to those who owned it initially. Why? You ever been around somebody who you have all rights to something, but you know, you know, I'm not touching that with a ten foot pole. If I accept that gift from that person, or if I accept this, or I do that, that person, knowing their nature, they are going to use that. And for the rest of my life, I'm going to hear, you owe me back for... Uh, yeah. They don't even say half of it. They don't even say you owe me back. They don't even say, I gave you. Do you remember when I gave you blah, 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 blah? <laughs> you know, and hint, hint, you owe me. Okay? Abram wanted nothing to do with that. And he distanced himself from the king of Sodom. Now, we don't necessarily read here that Abram was mean or cruel or unkind. But he definitely did not want himself connected with this king. Uh, bottom of page 6 there, the box with the quote. Uh, Genesis 14 portrays Abram as a person living faithfully within God's promises. Abram's actions showed that he had a confidence and faith in God's protection. In contrast to Genesis 12, 10 to 20. If you remember, that's where he went down to Egypt. Um, Abram did not act out of fear or self-preservation. Rather, he swiftly and courageously rescued Lot, trusting that God's promise to make him a great nation would guarantee him success in defeating kings and emperors. We see a little bit here into the life of Abram. It's a lot like ours. One day we're up, one day we're down. I hope that through the process of life, as we grow closer to the Savior, we're on more ups than downs. Um, and we always have the potential to live on the ups, on the highs. Why? Because God's made that a, a possibility, a reality for us if we trust in Christ. Um, but we're human. <laughs> and we still have our, our failures. Comments or questions before we get to the question? I know some parts, they, 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 they forget some parts. Abraham in the Bible too. Who forgets it? Well, some parts in the Bible forgets it. So. Well, you know, that's an interesting point, Leroy, because there are, there's spots, there's information that there's we have. Spots, they, don't, they don't mention, so. There's information that we have about Abraham from, from, from archaeology, from other sources, um, that's not in the Bible. And how do we deal with that? The Bible, especially here, it's written as a story. Okay? Now, when you're telling a story, do you tell every detail? <laughs> and, and what happens when those people who tell every detail, what happens when they tell a story? You lose interest. <laughs> it's like, um, okay, get to the point. <laughs> A good storyteller knows how to weave in those details that are necessary, that are important, that are helpful, that are colorful. He knows how to weave those in while keeping your interest. If he started telling all the details, um, if the, let's say the story involved a, a vehicle, and he starts telling you the make, the model, the engine size, um, the history of repairs and everything on this vehicle, you're like, okay, what does that have to do anything to do with this story? Is this a story of vehicle repairs or is this a story of, of my trouble of, you know, breaking down, you know? And sometimes we might highlight some of those things that, but you don't want to be too detailed. So although there may be, you know, as we study the Bible and we study other ancient texts and we study other writings, yeah, there's details and other things that could be true. But the Bible left it out because it's telling a story. 
No, and I don't want to. I don't want to discount this. And story, story leaves in our mind the idea of fantasy. That this is not true. This is just a. There's a billboard put out by some atheists, and I think it was up in Tennessee. It had a picture of a little girl with a Santa cap on, hands on the counter like this, and the caption read, "All I want for Christmas is to not be bored with fairy tales at church on Sunday." Now, is the church is it, is the Bible nothing more than fairy tales? No, it's a lot more. It's not fairy tales. These are real, live, actual events that took place. But that's why when we read the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all are adding, the details are different. But each of those authors is telling the story in a certain way to highlight a certain aspect. Um, so sometimes we do a lot of page flipping between the Gospels, because we want to get the whole story, when maybe we should sit in the gospel we're working and say, okay, what's, what's John's point here? Or what's Matthew's point? What's he driving at? What, what's his, his perspective? What's he trying to emphasize from this event in Christ's life? Um, anyway, good question, Leroy. Any other comments or questions before we move on? Yeah? That is an interesting. I don't know if you're. It, it just hit me. It's, it, it, it's an interesting thought, and it could be. Um, we need to go and see what some maybe commentators who, who wrestled through some of this have thought. He's saying that possibly, since Abram wouldn't receive anything from the king of Sodom, he gave it all back. Possibly that sat under the king of Sodom's saddle. You know, it was a burr under the saddle. So that may have helped lead. I mean, we're we're in conjecture here. This is not this is not Bible. This is just conjecture. That could have led to Lot being in leadership in the city. In that, you know, he he gets a position and title, kind of as a favor to Abraham. But and again, at the same time, maybe it was the king of Sodom wanted to make sure he stayed on good terms with Abraham or Abram. By putting Lot in position and being nice to his nephew. But let's talk about Lot a minute. Don't you think a situation like this... Yeah. Makes sense all circumstances. And yet, he goes right back to Sodom. And he lives in Sodom. Haven't you seen in your own life, and haven't you seen in, in the lives of those around you where they're getting beat over the head by sin, they're reaping the consequences, and they know the consequences stink, but they keep going back to it? They keep making that same pattern of choices? Um, and even when a guy like Lot, who has a godly influence in his life, a guy like Abram, he still goes back, and goes back, and goes back. Good thoughts. We don't know how this all worked out, but um, that's an interesting thought about the king and like in, possibly showing some favor Mal there. Mal died, dude. Only missed once for Malachi. Oh, Melchizedek? Yeah. 
Yeah, Melchizedek's only mentioned in a few verses here, but then he comes up later. Uh, a couple questions here for the series. Think of a situation that required you to act in faith. How did you respond, and how could you see God's hand in your decisions? I see you two chuckling. When I read this, I thought about the fire up the radius. <laughs> so, <laughs> and isn't that the way it is? For everyone else in here, probably the th this is my danger. I sat down and I looked at these questions, and I, w I wanted to answer myself. And I'm, the first one, I'm going back to, okay, we saw God meet the mortgage need, right? But in my own answer to that, you know, we we. We responded in faith as a church. You guys responded in faith to a, to a fire wiping out the can. Um, those are big events. And I began to think and almost almost um, get after myself. I'm like, I can't think of anything recently. I mean, that's all I can think of. And I'm thinking, what kind of a life am I living if I can't think of... Yeah, but see, that was, that was six months ago, Leroy. Yeah. That was a year ago we paid it off. Yeah. <laughs> that... Oh, okay. Um, it's been a little tight for us. And I guess okay, maybe I needed to find something different for work because I was in a place where I was in very little and pursued a couple of doors and God closed those, you know, turned the resumes and everything came up with. But it was already filled and um, a check from somebody right after that where uh, we haven't had any support from them since June when they caught us up for the end of the year on what they were giving and it fell to their shortfall. So, so, so they played catch up with themselves and it was right at the time you needed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. How does your faith affect those around you? And would you consider yourself being a blessing to others? We highlighted this a little last week where this is a little bit of a taste of that promise in Genesis 12 being fulfilled. I'm going to bless the world through you. I'm going to bless the whole earth through you. I realize that's specifically talking about Messiah. But there's a little taste here because Abram is being a blessing to all the cities in Canaan right now. And how does your faith affect those around you? you know, sometimes I don't think we know how it does. Um, our faith, what we do, what we don't do, sometimes we don't hear the reverb from others of how it's affected, but it is. Yeah. Is that as we as God blesses us and as God blesses others through us, as we articulate the blessings in a postmodern culture, how can that be interpreted? And I probably just threw out a phrase and you're sitting there, I don't know what you're saying, Pastor. Okay. By postmodern, today a lot of people think, well, that may be true for you, but is it true for me? Okay, we're we're living in an era where truth is relative. I'm not saying truth is relative, but people tend to think that way, that, well, that may be true for you, and that may be good for you, but it's not for me. How do we get over that? 
Okay, well, I, I'm not talking. I'm not talking in the realm of like I'm offended at someone who doesn't believe me. How do we get over that? To to convince someone who, hey, look, I can see God has His hand a blessing on your life, but I might just chalk that up to luck. Are there not unsaved people in the business realm? Oh, man, they just everything they touch turns to gold. You know, I mean, if we're honest, we're go we look at we look at the Bible and we see things like you know you're going to be blessed if you follow God, but yet it seems like the wicked are prospering, and it seems like truth is relative. Is it? They have their reward. Their their reward is now, and it's temporary. The reality is, with people who say, "Well," for some of you, it may come in the form of, "Well, Grandma, that's good for you." But I live in the 21st century <laughs> with computers and an iPad, and, I, you know, and I, I just don't live in that realm. The reality is, there's a longing in. The be filled on Jesus. Exactly. God doesn't change either. And that God created us with that void where we want to fill it with something. And what needs to be filled with is Him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no hope for the lost. There's no comfort for the lost. But to hear those dreaded words, you know, you have cancer. Well, for a believer, guess what? That, I mean, and I don't want to make light of it, but as a believer, there's hope. I may die of cancer, but life is not about the here and now. I'm going to spend eternity with my Savior, and guess what? In the end, cancer is going to die within my body, and I'll go to heaven and never suffer with it again. And um, I really don't want to make light of any of that, because I know several in here have had cancer in your families and things, and it, it's a hard thing to deal with. Um, but as a believer, there's hope. Yeah. You're saying thoughts on you and where they're going. Where they're going. Mm -hmm. they, they can answer it. They can answer it where, where they're going. They know. So. But they, they can answer it. I asked them. They asked me where I'm going. I said, I know where I'm going. Heaven. But right. Ask where they're going. I, said, I don't know. Yeah. There's a lot of people who don't know. They don't know where their eternal destiny is, Leroy. And we can, um, we can share the gospel with them. We can share God's word with them and pray for them, and hopefully they can understand and they can, and they make the decision to trust Christ and as their Savior. Out there, they don't know where to go. Yeah, and we need to be words of witnesses. Yeah. you know, just as Abram was, he was an example and a blessing to others. That we need to be that example and blessing to others. Uh, Pastor just.
precious. Precious. More precious than Yeah. And sometimes they don't make us stronger, but we see him, we see Christ more. And our faith is stronger because, okay, we see more of him. We've, we've had him carry us through a trial, and, and we know what it is to experience it. And, yeah. And each trial... You know, God always changes it just a little. He tweaks it just a little. Um, when you when you exercise and weight lift, they, you know, they'll do they'll they'll do their their curls this way, but then they'll they'll turn it their wrist a little, and then they'll do curls this way, and then they might do curls this way, and they keep turning it to exercise those different muscles. And God does that with our faith too. I'm going to close out here for Sunday school this morning. James one. Uh, verse 2 says, My brother encountered all joy when he fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, just like what Peter was saying. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Well, I didn't make it. I thought I'd make it through the lesson, and I didn't make it. So this is going to be a, a running joke here. So anyway, let's pray and we'll close out lesson for today. Father, we thank you for your word, and uh, Lord, we thank you for this example of Abram and Melchizedek and the uh, interplay between these characters. Lord, we build our faith. Lord, as we talked a little bit about this, of blessing um, others and how um, Abram responded in faith. Would you help us to this week? In your son's